From a dating perspective, if you're single, just out of a relationship, you just don't engage at all. Like no sourcing, no sexting, no thirst trapping, no nothing. And what you start to experience is you've disconnected from the drug. You recognize that there's this abandonment that is occurring and you're tasting truth. You're tasting reclamations, you're tasting power, you're tasting flow. And you're like, I'm going back to this place that doesn't have that, fuck that. There were the people who were like, holy crap, that was a massive decision and we're so proud of you. And then there was the other camp that was like, Mark is afraid of commitment and a classic fuckboy. Which there was truth to all of those perspectives. You don't use your voice so someone validates you. You use your voice to hear yourself. And that's actually where the healing is. The whole point is like, can you be you and be in a relationship? Can you hold on to yourself and be in love? And that is the hardest work, man. That's the hardest work. I did some research, read some stuff about your dad being your sort of relationship uh, counselor <laughs> growing yeah. up. And he would always have this wonderfully emotionally intelligent stuff to say. And w w where did he get that from? Where, where did your dad get that from? Was it something that he shared with your brother and your sister? Or was it just kind of you who went to him for counsel? Talk, talk a little bit about those early days and... Mm and the relationship you have with your dad or, and or your mom. Yeah, you know, I've never thought of, uh, did he have that with my sister and my brother? I would, I would say that he probably didn't as much, but I, you know, they weren't in the conversations I was having with him either, so he could have. Uh, but I think I really oriented towards wanting to figure out romantic love from a very young age. Like that was something I just had a lot of, and my dad would ask me a lot of questions, so I wouldn't say it was something I would have, uh, immediately gone to him for, but he would always inquire, uh, you know, ever since I can remember as even a little guy, just like about what I'm experiencing. Um, and then of course, as what you experience starts to be relating, that becomes the subject. And he, yeah, it, my mom and, and dad my, are actually, um, my brother and I are from my dad, my mom and my dad, and my dad was married before and uh, got divorced and then met my mother and had my sister with his first wife. But I always grew up with my sister being my sister. I never really thought much of that. And I, you know, I, I have asked him, like, did you have that level of emotional intelligence prior to, or was it birthed through your divorce? And he said, you know, it was kind of a bit of both and <laughs> like, how can you not, if you're willing to learn from your divorce? So I consider myself so lucky because a lot of men don't get that from their father. A lot of people don't, but especially men. And so there was a modeling of inquiry about relationship. But, you know, even despite that, uh, I, you know, I, I got betrayed in my late teens and then in my early 20s. And I closed my heart. You know, I made the idea that monogamy or relationship leads to heartbreak, commitment leads to rejection and abandonment and betrayal. And I betray myself in those circumstances. And yet, although that like narrative was operating at the baseline of my unconscious, I was in a relationship for five years after college and she was an incredible woman, but I just couldn't choose the relationship. I didn't know why we got engaged. Um, because, you know, I was kind of living the story I was taught, get married by 27, have kids by 30. And I was 27 when I got engaged. And when I got engaged, I, I met this moment I was always taught to want. And I realized I didn't want it. And I thought when I got engaged, all the anxiety and all the experiences I was having would, would go away because I did the thing. I, everyone told me I was afraid of commitment. Um, which I thought was ironic because, you know, it's like we want men who express themselves and are emotionally intelligent. Then the moment I would express myself, people would tell me, oh, that's not how you actually feel. You're not afraid. You're just afraid of commitment. You don't have anxiety. You're just afraid of commitment. Like this idea that you sort of like get walked away in shackles to your wedding. And I remember thinking, I, I think I'm supposed to feel differently than the way I feel when I do decide to do this. So that led me into learning about relationships on a much more linear level. I was a pharmaceutical rep at the time. And so I had a background in science. And so I was like, okay, well, the safest way to learn about this is I'm going to go learn what the science says about relationships. And 
inevitably, actually, that led me to the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, which was the first time I ever even thought of myself existing for a greater purpose than just being in a meat suit and becoming a good provider and getting married and dying, you know, and having kids. So that was the first time I thought about purpose. And, and it started to be awakened in me, this idea like, oh, maybe I'm actually here to teach about love, to teach about the thing that I'm the most curious about that, that I'm trying to heal and fix and resolve. And then I noticed, well, I'm like, well, why is no one fucking learning this? Like, every, why didn't we get learned, taught this? So yeah, that's sort of part of the evolution. Can you say more about what you were feeling when you were engaged that made you question whether or not it was the right thing to do to, and you inevitably called off the engagement, which is a massive choice to make. Um, but yeah, what were you feeling? Cause in case people are feeling similarly, talk about some of the specific signs and emotions and things. Yeah. Like what I was experiencing psychologically was a lot of anxiety. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I want to do this. I didn't want to vocalize that because I was afraid of what people would think. And it was almost like I was just going along with the thing and following every next logical step and then getting engaged because that's what I was supposed to do. And I thought it would buy me time, you know, uh, like if I did that, then she wouldn't ask me why we're not engaged. And then now I can just delay the marriage part. Uh, but what I realized was actually by which is, you know, maybe a good thing. It is a good thing that by making the engagement, by making the request, I realized that I was like committing to something. And I didn't like what I was committing to because I knew I wasn't capable of it. And it was only when I, and, and so I had an immense amount of anxiety. I had an immense amount of fear. I had an immense amount of what's wrong with me that I don't want this. And when I look back, what I was really experiencing was that I was creating a life I didn't want that my you could experience the same thing in a job. You can experience it in many things. I see now that the, the pathology of anxiety is not having access to choice, you know, because if you have access to your voice, you get to choose your life. If you if you can't share how you feel and have access to a yes or a no, your life gets steered based on, you know, where you let it and now, you know, I can look back and be like, holy, that was the first moment where I made a choice in so many years. I can't even remember the last time where it, it one, hurt someone else mm -hmm. and two, it meant that I could be judged by everybody around me. And yet I had no choice when I, I mean, I had choice, but I would have said if I, if I had gotten married, I would have gotten sick. I could just tell my stomach was churning. I was always feeling ill. And it, what really brought it to a head is that I remember being asked three questions. I posted my story on this forum. It was called The Runaway Bride. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was where people would post about their fears or they left a marriage they were uncertain about when they got engaged. And I posted my story and this woman wrote back, so many great, incredible angels wrote me back. And one said, um, she asked me three questions. Could you imagine what it would be like if she left you tomorrow? Would you be okay? And I was like, yeah, I'd be okay. I'd, I'd feel relieved. Second was, um, could you imagine what it would feel like to wait for her at your altar, whatever your altar is? And I was like, oof, that like, gave me a lot of anxiety. And the third question was, could someone else love her better? And that that question is what completely rocked me because I started, it was the first time I oriented to the problem from not about like me, but like my inability to choose this was actually bringing someone else down a path of misalignment. And I thought, yeah, someone else could definitely love her better. And she's worthy of that. And the follow up question to that, of course, because that could be true for us and we could step to the plate, you know, we could step up is, mm -hmm. you know, do you want to? And I didn't want to. And I didn't know why, but it was that not knowing why, but still choosing to say no, that was the trust, the faith, the, that, and then it would be my adventure to be like, why, <laughs> like, why, why can't I do this? I was living that question. And I would, before I ended the engagement, I would look up on a search engine because I don't think Google existed at the time. I would look up, um, how do you know if she's the one? 
that was like my point of inquiry. And then I realized that I wanted there to be a, an explicit search result to that. Yeah, man. Um, you mentioned man's search for meaning. You know, he talks about if you create a why for yourself, you can bear almost any how. But then you think, well, nobody wants to have to bear being married. You want to right. want to be married. <laughs> right. You want to maybe even believe in the idea that there is a one, there is a soulmate. And, you know, people talk about how I knew right away as soon as I met, as soon as I laid eyes with them, that that was supposed to be my person. And it doesn't sound like you had those those feelings. Um, and were you still talking to anyone about this at this stage in your life? Because what a lot of young people do is they, they talk to their peers and their yeah. peers, you know, are right there in it with them. So you're not getting the best counsel. <laughs> right. Um, you're getting other peers. people who are settling or other people who are leaving. Right. Or afraid right. Of so how do you even know who to talk to? Cause I know in my experience, Mark, when I was growing up, my parents, they were married for 30 something years. They, they're divorced now, but I wouldn't describe it as a happy marriage. Like as mm -hmm. a young person looking at them, interact, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they were the model of what I ultimately wanted. So I don't know if I would have even gone to my dad and talked to him or anybody really in my family. So how do you, how did you kind of navigate that? You know, when I told, when I was talking to my dad about it, actually, what was interesting, my mom and dad, you know, they could feel my suffering. They could see I was really stressed about this and they really liked my, my fiance at the time um, because she was very likable. And ah, man, that was the hardest because, you know, if it's a shitty person, you're like, peace. But this was, she's incredible as a human. She's just incredible. And she was everything on the list I desired. And I did have that feeling when we first met and dated and, you know, the thing is, I can see in hindsight, I was just terrified of being chosen by a woman. You know, I was terrified of being chosen by someone who could fully show up and call me forward, but also love me because I hadn't navigated that betrayal I'd been through. I was unconsciously avoiding fully available people because I thought availability led to betrayal. So uh, because I hadn't excavated that pain, it was, it was steering my life. And it was making me run from people who could really love me. And, you know, m when my dad, I, I was talking to him about it. I'll never forget where I was sitting on the phone. And he said to me that, oh, well, you know, you're just afraid of commitment. This is just the next sort of like leap. And, and I said, uh, do you remember how you felt the day you got married to your first wife? And he said, yeah. And I said, do you remember how you felt the day you got married to mom? Yeah were they different? Oh, yeah. I said, I feel the first way. And he was like, ah, and it was like this moment that 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 he like understood what I was actually I mean, I felt like I was living in this world of trying to figure this out on my own. And I didn't have access to something. I mean, I had access from a, a, a employee assistant program or like a money to be able to see a therapist. It just was like not even part of my, that word wasn't even part of my vernacular, you know? What was your coping mechanism? Were you the guy sitting in the driveway for half an hour before you got home? <laughs> yeah, I mean, not untrue, you know what? It was alcohol. It was like, I found I was staying later after soccer and having beers or I was, um, and when we broke up, I still had shadow coping mechanisms, you know? I, I tried to go right back to like my casual relationship, one night stand, I'll just bang my way out of this pain. But you know, anyone who's heard that saying to get over your ex, get under the next, let me tell you, <laughs> we all know it doesn't work. And you might have to end up staying with that under the next <laughs> and they become the next ex. So, you know, there's, I did see a therapist actually though, because when we were about to break up, I recognized I needed to see somebody like who was maybe more objective. And I only saw him once because I walked into his office and he said to me, hey, you know, um, when people think they're making the right choice, 50% of the time they're wrong and they get divorced. And I was like, wow, we're a real Tony Robbins here. And then he said, and for the people who think they figured it out and get married a second time, 70% of the time they're wrong. And I was like, okay. And then he's like, when you came in here, 
you already knew the answer to what your question is. And I was, it was so, it was like, it was a profound employee assistance program, truth telling, uh, which I don't know is a common experience for that. But I never saw him again. I walked out that door and I did end the relationship permanently. And I felt like a million pounds got lifted off my shoulders. But you know, there weren't blogs and you know, there was only music, music that just made you more sad. <laughs> you know, there wasn't like Instagram and, and people teaching. And now, you know, you could look up navigating heartbreak and probably find a thousand reasonably okay teachers at it and probably a hundred exceptional ones. And all their stuff is probably free, which is wild. I got a personal question. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but I think it can be helpful for people who may relate to what you're saying. When you ended it, looking back now, knowing everything you know, would you do it the same way or is there a different way that you would end it? Because um, obviously you weren't Mark Groves, the relationship guy who has all this stuff, no, spirituality. No, definitely and, not. Uh, and that was the beginning of the Probably just dream. had a couple beers and thought, okay, yeah, yeah. we go and just get it out of the In way. In the driveway. I, you know, I have often joke that like, and have reached out to to pre including her, um, to say like, I'm sorry that I didn't have the tools, you know, and, and as I've had more awarenesses, I've, I've shared those, uh, like I, I remember I wrote her probably like four years ago and just asked my wife, like, here, I wrote this, like to my ex fiance, how does it, are you okay with this? And she was like, yeah, that's great. And she wrote me back. Um, just like more awareness is like, wow, I just, I just couldn't receive love. It was, if it, I remember I had coffee with her years later and I said, you know, um, you might've thought that we just ended and I just like went to the bar and, you know, <laughs> and partied. And I said, in, in some ways that was true. I said, but, uh, you were actually the birth of everything for me. And so like, I just have so much gratitude, um, uh, for that experience. And would I change it? Yeah. I mean, God, yeah. I mean, we write about in our book and, and my wife and I have done, cause we dated for four years, then broke up and then got back together and, and, you know, now have a kid and all the things, but we actually did a closing ceremony for our relationship. And I wish I had access to even that idea of like, you know, I heard someone once say that you should, you should leave your relationship as you leave a house, you prepare it for the next owner. And I thought like, oh, that's such a beautiful metaphor of like, you would, you would clean it up. You would paint the walls. You would, you would restore, you would grieve. And, um, and I got to do that with my now wife. And, and I think in a lot of ways that was the birthplace of us coming back together because there was so much love present in the ending that there was a template created within both of us that love doesn't go anywhere when relationships change. And so that creates this deep safety to actually love more. And uh, I, you know, I wish I had the tools to offer that to my ex fiance to give her more understanding. But the truth is, I didn't know why I was leaving. I didn't know why I didn't want to be with her. And I think that's probably the questions, you know, she had, although I don't want to project that on her. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. I feel like a lot of people, even like spiritually aware people, people who meditate and do all the things sometimes can have the messiest oh, yeah. uh, endings as well. And it's, it's not until hindsight that we can reflect back and say, you know what, um, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to take things personally the way that, that it all went down and, and I'm going to do better the next time. Yeah. You just, you're just learning, learning as we're all just learning as we go. Right. You know, I've been meditating for 25 years and I'm still very much in it like everybody else and having the imposter syndrome of maybe I'm a commitment phobe and blah, 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 blah. You know, you know, the self-talk.
way it goes. But anyway, you were at the time you were you had so so this was your crucible, right? You were becoming yeah. what you are now. You've been reading the mark the human behavior books. I'm a, you didn't mention what it was in your book, but I'm imagining it was influence or how to win friends. Yeah, yeah it was uh, how to win friends and influence people. The game, the game. Uh, how to get anyone to do anything. Yeah. Uh, and there was a oh man, I forget what it was called, but it was a pickup artist book, and it was by a something D'Angelo. I forget David D'Angelo. David yeah. D'Angelo. Yeah. Cocky, funny, or something like that. I no, it was one of his others, but I get because I know it wasn't that one. But I remember reading it being like, holy fuck, this is like mind-blowing manipulation. This is like <laughs> next level. And, you know, that's the thing when you start to reach for those types of tools of manipulation. It's because you're operating from fear because you're trying to control. Um, much like, you know, the narrative you talked about of fear of commitment. You know, I talk about that a lot of like, you're, and no one's afraid of commitment. They're just afraid of where commitment goes. And it's usually unconscious, you know, and... And the other thing too, about like bringing closure or endings, you know, sometimes uh, it's actually not safe to do a closing ceremony. A lot of people who are more desiring repair or can't be with a lack of repair will put themselves back into unhealthy or, or toxic circumstances, trying to get repair again. And, and so what I'm saying is not permission to do that. And you know who you are when I say it. And the second one is that it actually doesn't require the other person, you know, if the other person's incapable uh, what you can do is just sit down with an empty chair and do a closing ceremony that way. Mm -hmm. And that could be like you put on music that means a lot to both of you, that you light a candle and that represents the, the relationship, that maybe you write out what you're ready to let go of and what you're learning from the relationship. And then you burn that and you walk through what might be a, something that symbolizes a threshold something that symbolizes and you could set up like two pillars or two candles and you walk through it but you don't go back through it you walk through it you blow the candles out and they move to the side something like that can be helpful yeah and you also mentioned in your book you said that people's main main concern is am i safe number one and then can i be myself and i know that's something i struggle with i struggle with in every relationship is same not can I be myself, but to what degree can I be myself? Because the mm. moment I hit up on a pocket of friction, I start recoiling, you know? Yeah. And I become like a 25% version of myself, just enough to keep the peace, keep things yeah. moving forward, and then eventually catches up with you every single freaking time. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the recoil always happens, you know? And it's, it's a cosmic uh, two by four usually. Yeah, you start to realize that protecting people from the totality of who you are is actually not in service of love. And and at the same time, when you discover that you've been hiding parts of yourself, you then realize that you've been hiding them for a long time and in probably, you know, recurring circumstances. And so what you're saying, I, I experienced too. And now, you know, mine is like this next leveling of like, how do I continue to access more voice, more truth? Because I think, you know, we're what we experience on a micro interpersonal level, we're experiencing on a massive cultural level. Like, can you stand in what is reality and face uh, being canceled, face being, you know, called a name that you're terrified of being called? And I think, you know, we're really seeing that come to a head. So what's going on or what they, you know, as they say, as above, so below, as within, so without. I think, you know, we're resolving and healing these patterns on a massive level. And to heal them culturally, we have to heal them interpersonally first, because that's how you, you bring self to culture, you know? So the greatest act of revolution is self-expression. And, and that is true in love, because the same liberation that experiences when you say, this is what's true, whether you choose to be in this relationship or not, we're not gonna ignore this anymore. Oh, everyone's free. Everyone likes that. Even though you just drop the elephant, right? And the, the elephant's already there. So you're like, that's the elephant. And everyone goes, fuck, I knew that was there. And then they're like, oh, I, I have all these adaptive strategies so I don't have to look at the elephant. I'm going to end this or I'm running or I'm going to get mad about you pointing at it. And what you do is you get back into the meditative state because we usually leave it in that moment and 
you realize that uh, it's about staying in your center and and what a gift it is to know all of you. And so we have to like believe that to be true to to make it revealed. Yeah, I want to unpack so many things in what you said, but there's one other piece to your yeah. life story that I would like to just talk about, which is your transition from pharmaceutical sales. I'm sure you were making into the, you know, well into the six figures and Talk a little bit about those early days. Were you doing like one-on-ones with people? Were you posting a lot and getting some traction and opportunities to speak? Or what was that transition like? Ooh. How long did it take before you, or did you monkey branch? You went, you held on to your last yeah. you know, sales meeting and then you grabbed yeah, onto right. an opportunity? Or, From yeah. a national sales meeting right into a <laughs> retreat. Um. Well, from the day that my engagement ended, I was about 27 and a half. Um, I'd say it took me a couple of years, maybe four, three years. Yeah, about 29, 30. I was sent um, a TED Talk. And then all of a sudden, I was like down the rabbit hole of TED Talks. And I found all these teachers. I couldn't believe that I could get 20 minutes of like these profound thinkers. And it brought me into like uh, listening to more Tony Robbins, more Gary Vayner, like Gary Vaynerchuk had a, a keynote he gave that was on there. Uh, Helen Fisher, The Brain and Love. She's incredible. She actually just passed this last week. Um, Sue Johnson, The Gottmans, The Hendrix and Helen Hunt. Um, I mean, Marianne Williamson, like you're brought to all these people that, of course, you know, you've been exposed to. And it's like. Eckhart Tolle, you know, you get just Carolyn Mace actually was, it has and continues to be a profound teacher for me, Abraham Hicks. So it started with my own experience, you know, as you said, the, the crucifix, the crucible, and it was then how do I fix this thing that's broken so that I can have great relationships and not fuck it up again and not take someone else down this journey. And I started to, Right. I remember thinking like I was sitting with my friend at, at dinner and she said to me, what would you do if you would do anything? And I was coaching her in soccer, actually coaching this women's team. And I said, I'd tour the world and speak about relationships. And she said, why don't you? And I thought, well, that's a great question. Why don't I? And I was deeply passionate about understanding at this whole time since I was in my teens, deeply passionate about understanding because I was in sales, how to manipulate human behavior. Like, how do I get someone to change products? And I started to see like, well, I'm really good at that. Why don't I use this to do good in the world? But why am I good at that and not talking about my feelings? So it really led me down this rabbit hole of, of deeply understanding. And I started, I remember the first day I posted on my personal Facebook page, something that I learned about relationship. I think I was 31 and or 32. And I remember I got like tons of replies to it just from people I knew on Facebook or, you know, didn't know. And I was so terrified that all the people I grew up with would be like, what the fuck are you talking about? And what are you doing talking about this? And that was always my greatest resistance. You know, now having read um, The War of Art, you know, you realize like there's this, this force that's really trying to operate against you, stepping fully into yourself, stepping fully into creation. And when you learn that that's normal, I think that would have been great to know then, but that it's normal. Right. That you're, you've been tarnished from the whole breakup, leaving the fiance. I'm sure the word on the street was that, you know, Mark's got some issues. Yeah. Not you know, only did I have those talk, issues. Talk about relationships. Yeah. Well, you know, there was like two camps. There were the people who were like, holy crap, that was a massive decision. And we're so proud of you. And then there was the other camp that was like, Mark is afraid of commitment and a classic fuckboy, which there was truth to all of those <laughs> perspectives. So, you know, I, it, what was really powerful for me though, is that I knew the day I hit publish on the first thing that I could no longer be out of integrity. And so I almost like needed to get to this place where I was still operating from these survival based places of, of avoiding intimacy, but experiencing intimacy, but tr controlling the depth of it through friends with benefits and one night stands, et cetera. And 
I knew that the day I hit publish, I couldn't do that anymore. And so when I hit publish, it was done. And it was, uh, it was interesting because eventually I did face the voices that were like, what are you doing teaching this? You're not in alignment with that. And they were true about my previous me, the person, these people had known me to be, you know, I would tell stories about getting random BJs or like, you know, like I, this is how I'd cultivated a status. This is how I'd cultivated a notoriety. This is how I cultivated protection so that people could Mark's fine on the outside. Everything's good with him. He's just playing around. He's just, you know, enjoying life and dating and blah, 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 blah. I was always honest with everyone I was relating to, but I was playing in the gray of language and I could see that now. And I could see that the mechanism, I didn't want people to see that I was deeply suffering inside, that I didn't know how to do love, that I'd never dealt with these massive betrayals. And um, it was through writing actually that I started to reveal more of myself. It was like I was titrating my capacity for truth and and who I was. I had to confront who I was and all this while I was a rep and I was working in, uh, at a high level, working in the hospitals and in the regions, launching products, et cetera, developing what we would call key opinion leaders. And I was also, I had an exception. I was blessed to have exceptional managers, but at the time I had this really exceptional manager and she helped support me in getting, going back to school and getting a, doing a program in positive psychology. And so I was building up this skill set while I was working and she knew I was, you know, kind of like straddling these two worlds because I was writing and I was starting to coach and I was transparent with my work that that was going on. Were you posting on a regular basis now on, on Facebook? I was starting to, yeah. And then in 2013, December, I went through a breakup with a woman who ran social medias for like pubs or something. And she was like, you should start an Instagram account. And I was like, what's Instagram? And then I saw it. And actually, after we broke up, I started it. So I used the fuel of that breakup. And I started it. And I would just post a picture and write about what I learned, you know, what was related to the quote on the on the picture on the meme. And I was told, Oh, you can't write long form content on there. It's not for quotes. It's not, you know, all the things that the resistance, right? The classic resistance. But at this point, you know, I was consuming enough personal development work that I was aware that when you started to expand, because I'd experienced it so many times that someone had put it into language, that your expansion is going to threaten people who are not claiming their expansion. You're stepping into your authentic truth, your path, your mission is going to be incredibly triggering to people who are not. And so I now had context to that. And I, and so I was about I went to a program, a, a one day workshop with Lisa Nichols. And she said something that was profound for me because I felt really out of integrity staying in pharma because I was starting to learn about the inflammatory impact of emotion and all that stuff and the corruption and all the things that once you poke your head in, you fall down the rabbit hole. I, and she said, use your current job as an investor in your dream. And so I was able to reconcile this transition where I, you know, I spoke to my soul and I was like, look, I just need to build this and then I'm good. And I think I had about 20,000 followers or something when I left. I was on there for 14 months or something. I left in April of, I want to say 2014. Um, but did you have an idea of like how much you needed to make ultimately to maintain the lifestyle that you had as a pharmaceutical rep? Or were you yeah, I mean, as a rep, product? I was making with bonus probably around 160 Canadian. So that's like 50,000 US, but <laughs> it was, <laughs> it's probably about 110 US, something like that. And I had a car and gas and I was working there for 14 years. So I had a pension. I had all the things, but I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, you recognize that there's this abandonment that is occurring and the abandonment is becoming more costly. And you're feeling, you're tasting truth, you're tasting reclamations, so you're tasting power, you're tasting flow. And you're like, I'm going back to this place that doesn't have that, fuck that. And I remember I, I scheduled a, a retreat that I did with my good friend, Vienna Farron, and it was in the April. And I gave notice in December to my boss, I'm going to leave in April. 
I knew that I had to just burn the boats. I knew I just had to leave. I was probably making something like $2,500 US a month in coaching revenue, et cetera. And we sold, I can't remember how many spots. I want to say like 16 spots to this. And I made something like, after all the costs, like 6,000 US, maybe seven. And I remember saying to a friend of mine, I had this beautiful, uh, like 600 square foot penthouse in this area called Kids. Penthouse is a strong term. The building was from like 1940. But it was the top floor, so it gets that title. And it had a 500 square foot patio and I could see the ocean. It was so beautiful. And my rent was like, I don't know, $1,800 a month. And I remember saying to my friend, I'm going to have to like get rid of my apartment and move in with UBC, University of British Columbia students down the road and like share a fucking house again. And he was like, why don't you just make more money? And I was like, that's such a rational, like use the constraint to create. And so I did. And, you know, it probably took me about a year and a half, two years. By two years, I was making as much as I had made as a rep. And then, um, you know, that just kept getting exponential and exponential. And then um, I, in another rebirth, <laughs> that went and and now I'm in the in the rebirth again and, and the growing, you know, I, I yeah. So so here I am. Yeah. What, what did Another you do? Another crucifix. What did you do differently? Like when you had that restriction, you didn't have the pharmaceutical rep paycheck anymore. Like what shifted that over those two years led to you being able to, to bring in as much abundance and support as you had enjoyed doing this thing that you weren't really that passionate about? Was it a mindset thing? Was it a, like you just worked twice as much, but you were, I worked you were a lot. now spending 40 hours on your own stuff instead of spending five hours and 40 hours on their stuff? Yeah. I mean, I was single at the time, so I was probably working, yeah, 60, 60, 70 hours a week because I was like, I posted every day, sometimes three times a day in my peak in 2021-ish uh, for eight years. So it was only in like the last, in those eight years, it was only in year six, seven, eight that I even repurposed any content. So I wrote for, I wrote every day and I was committed to it. And that, I mean, that was it. That was the main thing. And I would say that, you know, I was able to, recognize that there were times when, you know, I remember in the height of the, I forget the poet's name, but he was like super popular and he would always write about like, you know, women stepping into their power. Like she's a woman with a sword and she cuts the guy up, or what, you know, all these types of statements that are about like female empowerment. And of course those, and those are great. I'm not negating those, but you knew that if you posted something like that, it would instantly do well. Like she got rid of him and stepped into her power and her voice. And now everyone's happy except for the guy. But what I noticed is I didn't want, that's not what wanted to flow through me. So I could see that there was this negotiation with, do I want to create content that does well, or do I want to create content that I know is what wants to come through me that I want to talk about. But I'd say that I, during COVID, I met that again, I met this, I met more resistance in that time than I've probably ever faced um, in like what I desired to actually speak about. But the resistance to the expression was stronger than I'd, I mean, I'd never confronted anything, including like getting a uh, shadow banned for using a word or, you know, and you really, people think these things are just like mystical social media terms, but they're not. They're f very much for real. If you say the wrong thing, have the wrong perspective. And then when I say wrong, it just means inconvenient. Um, so yeah, I'd say the, the differentiating factor that led to the exponential nature of abundance was the commitment to self-expression and to authenticity and to alignment with integrity. Um, but you know, I've, yeah, I feel like I kind of, stepped out of that under the constraints of security and safety in 2021 ish, 2022, and then fully realigned and joined myself back up. And, and, um, you know, in a lot of ways, and this is not a martyr story. Uh, this is just the truth. Uh, 
realigning cost me a lot, but I would trade it always again and again and again, because the price of, um, the price of misalignment is too good on the body. It's too big. It's, you know, this is autoimmune. This is inflammation. This is thyroid issues. This is, you know, I see the correlation day in and day out with people who are not self-expressed. And when they finally step into self-expression, mysterious things, they didn't know why they had shoulder pain goes away there. You know, it's just, it's, it's miraculous, you know, and this is true. Like the body keeps the score. It's all the same stuff. Yeah, this is really interesting, man, because one of the things that I grapple have grappled with quite a bit, and maybe you can offer some some therapy to me. <laughs> no, but I, I totally agree. You have to express yourself. That's what I write about. That's what I talk about. Authenticity, blah, blah, blah. And, and as I don't want to get people to get triggered by this word, but as the leader in my relationship, I see myself as the leader, right? Yeah. Not better than the other person, but just the one who's willing to take full responsibility for everything that happens. Right. That's yours. That's right. mine. Yeah, yeah, that's me. And um, and what I've noticed in my mind is that I know that by expressing myself, even in a very compassionate, you know, as gently as I possibly can, giving all the nuance and everything that I think people deserve to have, um, especially if my opinion is solicited. If they ask me, what do you think, right? Right. Um, I know that it can lead to, I can lead to uh, two or three hours of of having to really process this, this um, the integration of my point of view with her point of view, mm -hmm. and at the same time, I'm living my purpose. I'm creating my content, and I think to myself, I don't really want to distract myself from <laughs> doing the things that I I want to do and ultimately need to do in order to keep the whole train moving forward to stop and have to process this nuanced thing for two hours with this person who, you know, we're still obviously getting to know each other and maybe my perspective isn't fully embraced or maybe hers isn't fully embraced by me, et cetera. So I just don't say anything because I want to, I want to salvage my focus on the deeper work of the things that I'm, that I'm doing. So um, I don't know if you can relate to that. I'm sure to some extent, maybe you can or can't, but, um, what do you, what are your thoughts on, on sacrificing the authenticity for the work or vice versa, sacrificing the work to sit in it with this person, but, you know, for someone who's not feeling driven, it, there's no determination of how long is this thing going to be until we get to the right, other right. side of it. Yeah, like how many hours we got? Because I got some stuff, you know? Right. I get it. It's interesting, right? Because you think what you're likely experiencing is not healthy processing, not to say it's unhealthy, but what I mean by that is that someone who constantly needs to process things likely needs to be in the experience of processing to feel important. So where like if you and I had a conflict and we sat down, I would imagine that we could resolve that fairly quickly and get to a place of understanding and self-expression and validation and empathy pretty quickly because we have the language and neither of us are stuck in some sort of story about it, right? But for a lot of people, especially like in a, let's say that heterosexual dynamic where a, a woman maybe didn't have a present and attentive father maybe left maybe abandoned maybe doesn't know their father that that experience of like processing they're actually playing out the need to like really know their their father to know them and so when we use confusion or misalignment or the need to dialogue as a way of connecting it can feel draining because the intention of the connection is not for clarity but just to be to be in each other's experience so if I have to stop sharing with you how I feel, then that doesn't mean I'm sacrificing authenticity, although I'm not getting to be the totality of myself with you. I'm actually avoiding draining my life force 
because it's not enlivening for me because your the wound is actually feeding off of the conversation. And so I, I mean, I have a few friends I could think of who have that desire to really process things. And I know, and we've talked about where that comes from and there's self-reflection that there's not an ability to self-regulate. So the regulation, the nervous system is seeking safety through being with others. So if they're not with other, they're not safe. So they really need to process everything. And also that disagreement means a lack of safety. So like if you and I don't agree on something, which I'm sure we don't agree on something, we're still going to be friends. There's no, it's not like, at, there's no condition. But for people who have experienced conditions, which, you know, a lot of religious people would be able, who have been re raised in religious households, would be able to relate to that. Like if I don't agree with, everything the church says, then maybe my family, I've actually witnessed families get rid of people. I've witnessed the religion get rid of people. And so innately, there's a fear that disagreement, it could also mean we got hit, we got hurt, we got abused, we got yelled at. So disagreement is not safe. We need to maintain cohesion all the time because there's this idea that assimilation means safety. Although what assimilation does is it removes polarity. Does that answer? Do you think that? Yeah, 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 100%. Um, and I think that's a good lead into what liberated love actually means, right? Because, and I love that you shared that you post it three times a day for years and years and years, and you never repurpose content because I think people take for granted when they read a book like yours, like you just pick up the book, you read it, da, da, da. but these are thoughts. <laughs> these are thoughts that have been organized, you know, in a very mm. elegant way over many, 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 many years of processing. And every time you put something out there, especially if you go public with it, you're going to get all kinds of perspectives back, people taking it personally, people projecting on you, people right. saying, this is exactly what I needed to hear. And so you kind of learn how to, to put your work through all of those filters, right? Before you yeah. hit publish on it. And a lot of times, you know, brevity is the hardest to write because it's easier to just put it all out there to apply to everybody's situation. But obviously you can't, you're not going to have the space or the time um, to get into it in those ways. So it's just, it's beautiful to see uh, a treatise that, kind of breaks down almost every aspect of the love process um, in the book, Liberated Love. And it's also a book that you co-wrote with your now wife. And, uh, and so that's an interesting um, element as well in, in that you all, it, as I'm assuming, I don't know her, but I'm assuming you're like traditional male, she's traditional female, which means you have different ways of seeing things. Yeah. And it, there seemed like there was a lot of symmetry in how you all expressed your, your, your principles, the relationship 1.0, the sacred pause, the relationship 2.0. So I guess first things first, man, let's talk about what is love? This is a question I ask yeah. every single person that I'm dating. How do you define love? Because I think as a society, we take for granted that everybody thinks love is the same thing, but people can have vastly different ideas of what love means, what conditions are placed upon it, if any, right? So how do you, how do you all define love? I define it as a fierce dedication to the truth. Like the truth is love. Those are synonymous. And we start the book out sharing a quote from Ram Dass where he talks about that. Like, why not use the relationship in service of love in service of truth? And, and for me, what I mean by that, because of course the experience of something like a word truth can feel very subjective, right? It's like, if, if I, say, think of a tree, you might think of a spruce and I'll think of a, of, of a, I don't know, like a pine tree. And, and that doesn't make either of our perspectives wrong. What it means is that there's a deeper understanding of the word tree, for example, by you and I having a conversation about it. And so when most relationships actually pivot around the avoidance of hard conversations, they pivot around the fear of dysregulating emotion. And when we do that, we're not in, yeah, right. And, and recovering, you know, all of us recovering, I would say. 
in. And I just keep finding more. What's really fascinating about having written the book, and I appreciate what you said about like these are experiences and thoughts and feelings that have transcended since I even started questioning and thinking about relationship. And of course, they were seated much younger, but they were able to be formulated and thought of and criticized. And, and then they met someone else who did the same thing and we did it together and we broke up and then we explored when we came back together, we're like, holy, we did this thing that no one's ever taught us that we did. And we saw some of the best people in the world. And we were like, these things need to be together. Like we, there needs to be a conversation about, um, you know, these baseline sort of like logistical skill sets and understandings of relational patterns. But man, it's so incomplete without a conversation about the nervous system, because that's really at the basis of everything. And then what are some practical ways we can actually create freedom in our relationship? Because, you know, if I said to someone, what is the number one uh, skill set you need to learn in a relationship? I'd say almost everyone will say communication. And yet almost none of us actually take the time to master communication. And yet, if you master a relationship, which means mastering communication too, you'll master life because it's all the same stuff. And so there's nothing that's made, like everything is made better when you're better at relationship. So it's like, if you just do that one skill, like you become a better salesperson, you become a better networker, you become a better at everything. And I think when you explore the dynamics that you experience in relationship, just by picking up a book or listening to this podcast, you're taking the time to say how I relate matters, who I am matters, how I show up matters. And writing the book with my wife was like a profound experience because you have like two worlds that have to come together and, and, and make a separate, like a separate third entity. And it was so beautifully representative of how we see relationship, which is that our relationship is actually separate from both of us. Both of us coexist as separate entities that we, the space between us is the relationship. And so it has to be treated as sacred. We talk about in the book that one of the principles of liberated love is um, mutual sense of positive regard. Like this idea of just like, how do I hold you in the highest possible esteem, especially when I don't want to, <laughs> right? Because let's be honest. And, and honoring each other's path, because you know what you're talking about is like, your path is so important to you, but how do we use the friction of our relationship to actually both come more alive, both create more purpose, both step more fully in our voice. And what I've learned, which I'll just like button up this rant, is that when I started to discover my voice and the word no and yes, and really authentically connecting to that, because I was a people pleaser. So like people pleasers, their no is really bullshit. It's like what I started to realize when I was authentically saying no to things is that myself and what I agreed to existed so much, so much further back. It was like, every time I said no, I was like, Oh, actually we should say no to that. And then that, and then that. And uh, you start to take up more and more space and then you realize you're allowed to take up space. And if you value your own space and your own boundaries, your own sovereignty and your own self-expression, you'll value that in other people. It's people who don't have access to boundaries that don't like boundaries, you know? So, yeah. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Speaking of boundaries, you talked about and, and communication, right? I agree. I think, I think if you can have a hard conversation, if you learn the art of having a hard conversation, then you can pretty much, you can relate to anybody. Right. Yeah. But the question is, how do you do that? A, B, do both partners need to be at the same level of self-awareness in order to have that heart conversation? Because you also talk about blind spots. You talk about hooks, emotional hooks, particularly like gaslighting. Um, and people aren't intentionally trying to gaslight anybody. It's just that it's just like you, they switch into this this mode 
that makes it very difficult. If you feel like I'm trying to be self-aware, I'm trying to own my experience, but for some reason it's not translating when um, I'm getting reflected back what this person is hearing or feeling or experiencing. So what are some tips for people out there who need to have a hard conversation like now? We need to talk about this now, but they're afraid of making it worse. Well, I mean, the first thing is that no one person can do the work of two in a relationship. And I think if you identify that way, you should read our book <laughs> because <laughs> we really talk about that. It's like, you have to stop taking up the space that the person needs to step into. Like we have to create the space to invite them forward. And then through their own autonomous choice, they step forward into it because man has, if you've ever had someone say like, you have to do this, you're like, mm -hmm. you know, when, or you have to read this or I need you to, there's a resistance that's innately there. And especially for people who are avoiding understanding more about themselves in relationship, like they have to meet that moment and that choice of their own volition. But with that said, I think we can invite them there in different ways that are more likely to get received because saying like, I want you to listen to this fucking podcast is probably not going to get the podcast listened to. But if you said, Hey, like you and I, that's important to me. Our relationship is really important to me and, and me understanding you on a deeper level is important to me. And I want to know what are some ways that would be helpful for you to feel like I'm making that effort and the other person gets to respond or not. But what it does is it starts to create this culture of like, Hey, we're actually going to talk about the things that are hard in our relationship in service of both of us. And that one of my favorite quotes from the Gottmans is, um, relationship masters don't leave each other in pain. They repair, they repair, they repair, you know, and, that's something that is just at the core of really good relating is like, we don't want to leave each other in suffering. And so if you're someone who's like, I want to have that hard conversation, but I'm afraid it won't go well. Um, one, you can learn the skills. So the first, you know, might be like, Hey, I, I really want to be able to share something with you. Uh, do you have a moment? And, you know, and then these are really courageous conversations. So, you know, I, I was thinking of that quote from uh, We Built a Zoo, that movie, which is, this is the only quote I'll ever bring from that movie. But that one where they say, uh, uh, everything like profound in life just requires 10 seconds of absolute courage or 20 seconds. Like, and I think about that. Can you just dig deep and find 10 seconds of just unbridled courage that allows you to say, I miss you. I'm mad at you. I'm frustrated. I miss us. Or this isn't working for me right now. And then I'd really like it to, or I wouldn't. Right. So we were like really just saying, I, I just need to get these truths that are in me outside of me. And Ram Dass has this thought that to be in integrity is for the truths to live within you, to be the truths that live outside of you. And when those are not in alignment, you send a message of love and fear. And I think we always aspire for that. I think I spent the majority of my life unconsciously not doing that. And then when I finally became aware that it was like, by making what is inside outside, I was free. And not making anyone responsible for me to feel accepted for that. You know, because that's the hook, right? It's like, I need you to validate my self-expression. And it's like, no, you don't use your voice so someone validates it. You don't use your voice so someone says, I like your boundary. You use your voice to hear yourself. And that's actually where the healing is. Yeah, man, Ram Dass was a G when it came to relationships. Boss. I love, I love the, the best thing you can do for me is work on yourself. The best thing I can do for you is work on myself. Right. And that like just so profound. It was like this level of self-responsibility. You know, a lot of relationships are not founded on that. And, you know, Stan Tacken, who's a world renowned therapist, psychotherapist, he talks about how the reason relationships fail is they fail to create agreements at the start. And this isn't anyone's fault. It's that we're not taught that 
Like, how are we going to handle conflict? How are we going to navigate disagreements? What are we going to do when one person is feeling unheard and unsafe? What's our strategy? So that you create these agreements about it. And then, you know, what are we going to do when we're both like really lit up and things aren't good? Like, do we have a safe word? And I remember hearing a couple talk about saying, I love us too much to continue right now. And then that being like, but I want to come back to this. I want to hear it, but I feel like we're just both too, too lit up to do that, too activated. And you know, it's funny because like, I know that skill set. I know that. And when my wife says that, I'm like, oh, like I want, I want resolution. Like, don't you try to get away right now? Yeah, I, I, that's something that my uh, ex and I did fairly well. We would, we would get to a point where we would admit, look, we're having different experiences right now. And that means let's take a little, let's take a little breather and, and then come back to it. And then I share five things that I'm grateful for about her. She shares five things about me that she's grateful for. And what I also noticed is that with all the systems and frameworks that we'd, we, we developed as we were trying to sell the boat, we were trying to learn how to build the boat, um, <laughs> they would, they would expire. They wouldn't be as useful down the line as they once were. So we'd have yeah. to, we'd have to iterate. We'd have to evolve them. We'd have to change different right. things. Need because... a more sophisticated tool. Yeah. Cause the problems get more sophisticated. The wounds are deeper, you know, they're, you're like getting to the, the depths of, I mean, when a wound is activated, it's a sacred moment, you know, it's saying like, I trust this experience, um, or don't, but it's, right. it's being brought forward. And it's like, imagine if, the human you're relating to and you provide this for someone else saying like, I really see you suffering right now. And like our priority as a couple is to help resolve this. And, and so that, I mean, it's such a different way of orienting to love. Then like, instead of this, it's, it's like walking side by side and the challenge is in front of us, not between us. Yeah. The other thing to be aware of, I found is that when someone is triggered, and this is just from my work in meditation, I've done deep study into stress and how stress, the triggering effect can shut off the prefrontal cortex, yeah. which then reroutes everything to your amygdala, which gives you two <laughs> options running and fighting. And those really literally feel like the best reactions right. to whatever the person said is to fight them either through confrontation, argumentation, stonewalling, passive aggression, et cetera, or get the hell out of there, you know, right. like just to escape and, co and and avoid the uh, the situation altogether. So I think it's important for people to, to understand that because you, you write in the book, you say attachment work is actually nervous system work. And when someone's right. nervous system is, is experiencing the 4th of July effect, my words, not yours. <laughs> I like that. You can't expect to have a rational, reasonable conversation with them in that moment. No. And even the idea that we think we can, you know, but what's so interesting too, when you ask someone when they're really activated, how old do you feel right now? The first age that comes to them will be very relevant to usually where the imprint of that reactivity or automated system uh, comes from. And I mean, I know you deeply in your work, this is deeply relevant, which is like, if that's the automated way, then like, if all of a sudden I'm in an activation and I go, Oh, urge, like, let's go this way. Instead, the neural pathway, the mind, the nervous system is all going like, no, 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 no. Even though that's health, even though that's well being, it's like, it's not familiar. So you have to forge a new path in your brain. And that requires mindfulness that requires, you know, meditation as a skill set is so imperative, because it turns that perceivably 0.1 seconds into one second. And that completely changes your life. I find it hard to, you know, get someone out of that state for myself. It's almost like we have to be able to have tools that we've already rehearsed and practiced in anticipation of getting out of that state. And I guess if we don't have them, the next best tool is an apology and just an right, acknowledge right. You know, I was just triggered right now. And people, I don't think people realize how far that can go by just oh, so powerful. acknowledging it, owning it, and 
and asking, you know, for forgiveness even. Sorry for, for being triggered. Because then it gives the other per per person permission to do the same thing. And that was another moment. Those are other moments in my relationship that I'm really proud of. Is when mm. I personally was able to say, as the meditation guru who knows all about stress, I was just triggered just then. Yeah. You know, and, and what you saw in me yelling or whatever is not who I am. It's not who I want to be. That was 10 year old light, you know, whose mom didn't give him the benefit of the doubt. And, and just talking about it in that way was so liberating, right? So, so liberating. What so are some powerful. other ways that we could regulate? We could self-regulate. Cause that word, that term comes up a lot these days. You need to regulate. Yeah, yeah, you you need need to regulate. regulate. How do you do Regulators. that? Regulators. That's a good song. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's the practical tools, right? Like meditation. I'd say cold water exposure is actually very powerful. The reason is, is that when you are experiencing cold water and let's say you do it for 10 seconds, the first time you ever do it, your body is saying you're going to die. But if you can actually be with that, you realize you're not going to die and you realize you can handle hard things. So you start to increase your capacity for discomfort and that actually translates relationally. Um, breath work, again, another way to like learn how to regulate as you're starting to feel yourself get activated. Regulation boundaries are really good <laughs> for regulation because they create rules around how you're going to engage and that will allow you to feel safe. And ultimately what I'm saying when I say that is that you have access to what does work and doesn't work for you. And you will, you trust that if something that doesn't work is present, you're going to remove yourself from the circumstances or change them. So ultimately what it's saying is when shit goes down, I have my own back and I know I have my own back. I have the evidence that I have my own back. And when you do that, when you have access to your voice, you have access to a deep sense of trust and knowing that you're the one who creates safety for yourself. You're not waiting for somebody else to do it for you. I'd say the most powerful way to begin to step into that level of access of voice is by starting to keep small promises to yourself. So it seems trite or unimportant to say, hey, if you make a commitment to make your bed every day, that's unimportant, but it's not. It's actually incredibly important because what it does is it builds the, the equity and the evidence that when you say you're going to do something, you do it. And if you find yourself, and, and The Four Agreements is a great book to always come back to, but one of them is you are your word. So you realize like if you say you're going to work out tomorrow and you don't, you might be like, well, no one else knows that I didn't, but you do. And that's actually the most important you know, we can use community to help change because we make a commitment to the collective and the shared values of the community hold us to our values. But really, at the end of the day, it's our word with ourselves and our relationship with ourselves. I love the cold shower suggestion because literally and figuratively, you're in the heat of the moment and the cold shower can kind of douse that heat. And it's something I've been actually doing myself for many months now. Every day I take a cold shower. And it, there's nothing that gets you, I, I equate it to maybe rock climbing can get you as present as you are oh, in the yeah. cold shower. But in, in both of those situations, it's hard to go find a rock climbing wall when you're in the heat of the moment, but you can always go into the shower <laughs> and just turn on the cold water for, like you said, 10 seconds. And it just drops you right into the moment. Because even with meditation, I talk about how there's no such thing as an emergency meditation, because all you're going to do is end up thinking about whatever the thing is, and it's not going to feel very meditative. Um, when you're going through that experience. So, but I love that. I love that idea of the cold shower. I'm going to try that if I get into another situation like that soon. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> see how, what kind of effect that, that can have. Okay. So you talk about relationship 1.0 and then relationship 2.0, and then there's this thing in the middle called the sacred pause. And as we said, you can have these ungraceful endings to the relationship. Are you suggesting that a sacred pause, which is a moving away from each other, to heal and whatnot. Is that something that's premeditated? Is that something that happens just coincidentally um, with a, a intention perhaps to come back at some point later or talk a little bit about the sacred pause concept? Yeah, so 
we uh when we broke up and then got back together um kylie named that the sacred pause and she jokes you know that's what you get to call it when you get back together but otherwise it's just a breakup yeah um, nobody thinks about getting back right, together when you break right up. right so we we were like hey you could use this technology regardless right so if you're in a relationship with someone and you actually do desire to move through patterns you can actually create what's what we would call a sacred pause but you would create the agreements you can live with that person you can be you know have kids with that person and you can actually create the agreements to stop the patterns that you're currently doing and make agreements around creating new patterns and we talk about that in the book like how would you navigate that what would that look like but if you're going through a breakup you know, recently I was working with someone who said um, they went through a breakup and then they were talking to me. They had read our book and she said that um, they were going through a sacred pause. And I said, well, did you guys agree that you were going to take time apart and then come back together? And she said, no. And I said, well, then it's not a sacred pause. It's a breakup. And and you've made it a sacred time for you because there's no contact for three months. So that's your choice. But you're calling it a pause because you're still holding on to hope. And the only way to actually heal is to get right with reality. And the reality is the relationship's over. And so you have to actually be with that reality because that's the liberating truth. Because then if you can acknowledge the relationship's over, then at least you can heal and move forward. And if you desire that person to come back into your life or desire to create another relationship or desire to potentially do either of those, you just want to be able to acknowledge all of those possible outcomes. But what I'll say that a sacred pause does from a, that breakup perspective is it says, I'm going to double down on me. Like I'm going to go into healing boundaries. I'm going to step fully into myself. I'm going to, um, I'm going to notice that I want to be with them when it's done, but I'm going to move towards it doesn't matter. And what's inevitably happens if you take three months to do that is by the time you get to the end of the three months, you don't want the beautiful relationship you've built with yourself to be disrupted anymore. Like you found such a standard of your own behavior and integrity with your word that you don't fuck around anymore. You're like, I'm not, I have no interest in that. And so you, you start to realize that the, and I'm such a stickler to languages, it's like, it's not about getting back together, even though you can desire that. It's about meeting moving forward. So are they on your path of progress? If they're not on your path to progress, and you have to go backwards, then you don't want that because you have to go back to who you were. And you have to let go of the things you've just built. And you're going to feel that in your body. From a dating perspective, we talk about taking a sacred pause. If you're single, just out of a relationship, where you actually don't engage with the sex that you're interested in you just don't engage at all like no sourcing no sexting no no thirst trapping no nothing and what you start to experience is you've disconnected from the drug that makes you compromise your choices and you start to explore through our book we do it um all these different patterns and all these ways that you've related and you start to heal and you know, I have someone who was like, recently, I was like, so yeah, we gave into this agreement. She needed to go into a sacred pause. And she said, but I've already done a sacred pause. And I was like, okay, when? Tell me about it. Well, no, I've been single for four years. And I was like, oh, that's not a sacred pause. You can't retroactively go back and label <laughs> right. what you did. Right. right. She's like, but I haven't dated anyone. Well, I've dated and I've been on Tinder and I've been on Bumble, but I haven't like been in a relationship. I'm like, yeah, but you haven't intentionally created a space that is sacred for yourself. You know, this technology is, is a technology used in throughout history is like going into this experience of self, like fully immersed in self. And of course, what inevitably happens, I'd say it's 100% of the time, I've never seen it not happen, is that somewhere in that pause where we're not dating, we get presented with the perfect test to break our agreements. And some of us will break them and, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you have to get back into the container. And um, if you know that it's coming, then you're able to see it. And anyone who wants you to break an agreement with yourself to be with them is a red flag anyways. Yeah. I feel like that's true with any transformational work. There's going to be, you're going to be tested. If you're doing oh, it properly, yeah. there's going to be a test. Like a good and test, like a good, test. Excellent. 
like a booty covered in coconut oil, like that kind of <laughs> test. Like it's, it's always like this almost fully ready, almost blah, blah, blah. I worked recently with a woman who, uh, she broke her paws a week before and she was asking a question. She was in a group that we were running and, uh, she was really funny. She was saying, oh, I met this guy and like, I was a week from my container, but like, you know, he was so aligned and da, 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 da. And here's what happened. And, and she's telling this story and I'm like, wait, what? Like I hear the, but I left my container early and I don't know if I can choose him. Like, I don't know if I trust myself or like, he doesn't feel like, I don't know. And I was like, wait, 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 you broke your container. And she's like, yeah, no, like, whoa, you're just going to like drop that like just like move on from that i'm like that's the most important piece like of course you don't trust your choice in him you don't trust you you didn't trust yourself in relationship to him you only had a week and you left yourself a week before like you got to get back in your container and he was not aligned eventually right that was figured out but she went back into her container for another three weeks just to like really be with that. And she was crying because there was this recognition that she had broken her trust and her agreements with herself for him, which that is such a powerful knowing because then you realize that you still have leaky spots, spots where you're willing to compromise your own values and agreements for, for connection, which is what we're healing. That's the whole point is like, can you be you and be in a relationship? Can you hold on to yourself and be in love? And that is the hardest work, man. That's the hardest work. And the other side of that equation is that if that person is truly the right fit, they can wait three weeks. They can wait a month. They can wait three months. They can wait That'd six months. That would be the hottest shit ever if someone yeah. was homeless, like, <laughs> I got, I'm in this container. Nice to meet you. But right. I right now do not want to engage. I'll take your number. Right. And if it feels aligned when we're done, I'm in. If not, like I'll, I'm open to exploring it. If not, all good. Like that's badass. You know, you're that other person's waiting like three weeks. That's all I got to wait. All right. 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 So you all wrote this book together. What are some misconceptions that people may have around relationship experts writing a relationship book? <laughs> well, yeah, that it's done with ease and joy. That might be the first <laughs> one. Um, it was hard, man, because we were like moving a lot at the time we were my wife got pregnant during that time. We actually submitted the manuscript, the final manuscript the day before our son Jasper was born. Um, and it was a lot of preparation for birth, really. Um, because, you know, as I said earlier, you have these, a, a child is two people's DNA coming together and create the separate entity. And a book is two people's, all of them coming together and creating a separate entity. And also you had the creative challenge of our two different ways of creating. Like, I'm much more like, how do I feel right now? Do I want to write? Do I not? My wife's like, they have these things called deadlines and you don't get to do that. So there was a lot of friction from the, the bumping up of our creative styles and also like deadlines. I don't like deadlines. So there was like this, I would say I was more rebellious and harder to uh, rein in. Um, but we did do it. And when we finally did it, I remember uh, in a podcast that we did together, they were like, would you write another book together? And we were both like, mm, probably not. Um, <laughs> like we love each other, but my wife. That's why you wouldn't do it. Cause you love each other. <laughs> exactly. I was like, we have a kid now. We wrote a book and my wife is like such a pro prolific writer mm -hmm. that she has so many books in her that, that she needs to write that are trying to move through her and, and she's stepping towards now. And there've been a lot of contributions to this relationship genre. We've had the Gottmans, who you talked about. We have Helen Fisher, right? We have Men Are From Mars. We have Jay oh, Shetty. Yeah. Where does your book, Liberated Love, what does it add to this genre that people wouldn't necessarily get in any of those other books? Well, the first thing is that it's the first book written on codependency as like sort of the main sort of over arching subject uh, since really since Melody Beattie's book, Codependent No More, which is such an exceptional book. That book was based on um, the premises of Coda and, and Al-Anon. So 
you know, codependents anonymous and, and people who are in a relationship with alcoholics. So it was really from this framework of being in a relationship with an addict, which all the patterns are the same. It's just that that's not everyone's experience. And so we really wanted to normalize that it is like most people are in codependent relationships and this isn't, you know, we need other people. So there's this idea that healing a relationship is about not needing other people. And we're saying, well, no, that's not it. You want to be able to need other people. You want to be able to trust them, but you don't want, you don't want to compromise yourself, your safety, your security, your health, your well being for relationship. And I mean, almost, I'd say, 99.9% .9 of people I've ever met in my life, especially through my relationship work, are in some sort of dynamic where they compromise themselves or they're in a relationship with someone who compromises themselves. And both of those dynamics are part of the codependent dance. So I'd say that um, we were really honored to be able to be in that category. Um, and then secondly, is we like really brought well, one, we're a, a husband and wife who wrote a book together, which Harville Hendricks and Helen Hunt have done that. And they're incredible. Um, and so that feels great. And the other thing is we really overlap these relationship knowledge subjects like um, attachment and nervous system and these types of dynamics. But we talk about things that like, what does it mean to truly be in a relationship that's about bringing yourself fully alive? And what are the tools and techniques and technologies that we can do to do that? So it's both like, here's what you need to know as a skill, and here's how you implement that. And uh, the sacred pause is for sure, a very unique thought process and a very unique technology or, or premise to bring into it. And um, last but not least, uh, I think the audio book, what's really powerful about it is at the end of each chapter, we actually have an unscripted discussion about the chapter and how it applied to our lives and what we learned. I really enjoyed um, chatting with you more. There's so much here. There's, there's like so much we did not get to, but I think people need to just go ahead and, and buy the book and read it. And whether you're in a relationship whether you are not in it, whether you're in your, your sacred pause without realizing that you're in your sacred pause. <laughs> yeah. um, I think this is, there's so much useful information in this book. And, uh, and it was awesome just getting a chance to connect with you. I've listened to you a lot in your, in your own podcast. You've got a very popular Mark Groves podcast and it's pretty much dedicated to relationship topics. Um, with all kinds of influencers and luminaries from all, all fields. So yeah, and you, 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 the way you, you share is as if you are just thinking of things in the moment, which is really beautiful. Cause a lot of times when you, people have done a thousand podcasts about their book, you hear these like scripted sort of, you know, stories that they've told a million times. And I didn't get the sense that you, you were doing that. It seemed like you were just really, being very present with it. So I just want to acknowledge you um, for that. And thank you. Your book came out in April mm -hmm. of 2024. I heard Malcolm Gladwell talk about how when Outliers came out, um, he had this little footnote about 10,000 hours. And that became like the thing that everybody, you know, caught on to from that book. And since your book has been out in these last several months, is there anything that people have really kind of dialed in on that, that surprised you? Yeah. You know what? I actually didn't realize how powerful the concept of a sacred pause would be. Like when Kylie and I wrote the book and she inserted this idea, this suggestion, I was like, eh, like that's, I don't know how that's going to land. Like I, I didn't, I just wasn't fully bought into it at first. And then once it all came together, cause I just thought how confronting is that idea, you know, of taking a sacred pause, but I realized I'd done it. She'd done it. You know, we'd worked with people who had done it. We just hadn't called it that. And I was like, Oh, you know what? This is actually so potent. And actually my fear that it's confronting is actually exactly why it needs to be in there. And then I was so pleasantly, 
surprised by how many people are like, holy crap, like I'm in my pause or I'm doing this. My couple, my wife and I are in a pause. My, and it's just been really beautiful to see people just even bringing the pause forward is actually one of the most powerful conversations to have as a couple, because it acknowledges that you are always at this intersection of, are we in, are we out? That's always present. And so it's like, if we're in, what does that mean? If we're out, what does that mean? And can we actually just really, if we're going to lean in, lean in, and if we're going to lean out, let's just claim that. So many people, I think when they're giving relationship advice, want the people to stay together. Um, and as much as I would desire that, if that's what someone's supposed to experience in their relationship, and that's what both people desire, they certainly can do that through the book. But I'm also like, as soon as you start giving advice based on desired outcomes, you don't give, it's not, there's not a dedication to like, let's reveal what is actually true for each person's path. Does it align? Does it not? And so I, I feel really, um, proud that that it is an objective invitation to both people moving towards what's best for both of them. Yeah, I feel like that's been really one of the big missing elements of relating to people because that is a part of it. I know for a time there, I was the world's foremost expert in breaking up and getting back together with the same person. And, um, <laughs> you know, and not realizing what that was about or not creating a space for myself to do very intentional work when you're, when you're apart, but that's yeah. something that people can actually talk about. And maybe there could be even, I don't know, maybe there could be like a sabbatical where you just take a month apart, you know, without breaking yeah. up, without going through all the drama, you, you just can. recognize, Hey, we're having these different experiences quite often. Let's just take a month and just, you know, I'll go off into the woods and to a cabin and you go do whatever you got to do. And, or we'll just like you stay in this part of the house. I'll stay in that part of the house. Speaking of which, what do you think about different rooms, different bedrooms, different bathrooms, uh, kind of in, in, in the same house? You know, I've heard a lot more about that, uh, recently. Um, you know, right now my wife and I stay in different rooms cause she's co-sleeping with my, with our son. So, uh, I'm fully supportive because it, I get a tremendous sleep <laughs> from it, but compared to when I'm sharing a bed with him, cause he likes to slide his fist onto my throat when he rolls over or like, you know, um, and I'm afraid of bumping him. So I don't sleep very well, but yeah, you know, I, I think it's either, but it, it, there's, it's like our long distance relationships better or whatever. It's like it, it's really the two people that compose it. And why are they choosing it? Are they choosing it? And do they still make the time to come together intimately and for connection? And if, if all these conversations are just out, like sometimes we move to separate rooms because we're actually starting to create division in the relationship. We're just like slowly tearing each other apart, you know, instead of just ripping the mandate off. And you see this when people step into open relationships too, they open it instead of ending it. They think that's the pathway. And I'm not saying there's no judgment on, on people in open relationships. I just see that as a transition often to end up being monogamous with someone else. And, and you get to put that one under spirituality. So it doesn't have any criticism, you know, but it's, it can be often in a, a ethically non-monogamous, <laughs> right. Which again, like it doesn't mean it can't be great, but I also am like, it's often used as a tool of avoidance. And, and so, yeah, if you want to have separate rooms, I, I don't think there's a good or a bad. I think it's just like, what are the conversations and agreements about it? What fears does it bring up? What, what positives does it bring forward? Um, are you revisiting it after a couple of weeks? How does it feel so that people are really, both people are being honored. What do you need more of? Oh, you need more cuddle time before we go to bed. Great on the couch or whatever that means. Um, I think it all just offers more material to become better communicators and more liberated in the relationship. Yeah. It comes back to that skill, having to have yeah. conversations. So yeah, that's great, man. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's also a great teaser to get people to go deeper into your ecosystem, your body of work. Um, the book is Liberated Love. The subtitle is Codependent Patterns and Create the Love You Release Codependent Patterns. Let me do that again. 
The book is Liberated Love. The subtitle is Release Codependent Patterns and Create the Love You Desire by Mark Groves and Kylie Macbeth. Cool, man. Thank you again. Yeah. Looking forward to hopefully crossing paths with you at some yeah, man. person. That'd be great. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever wanna see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.